Greetings and welcome to Mystery Babylon Radio on November 13th, 2013. Uh, my host tonight is <clears throat> Jörg Glisman of Belgium. Welcome to the broadcast, Jörg. Hello, Walt. Thanks for having me. And uh, my my name is Walt Stickle, and, and we're uh, I'm located in Oregon, and and uh, Jörg is uh, located in Belgium. Anyway, and the topic tonight was a continuous series of uh, the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. And uh, last week, uh, we, uh, we covered uh, the first two Reichs and kind of got, got a rounded view of the history before. We're, we're building up to the Third Reich, but we want to lay the foundation from the, from the Reformation and to and to uh, at the present time. So anyway, uh, 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 Yerk, uh, uh, go ahead and, and start uh, the, uh, in, in the recap. Yeah, okay. Um, I first want to go a little bit more into history because today everybody speaks about Germany and uh, the three Reichs that it had, but most of the people are not aware that the first German state, no, that German nation state, which we should better call it, uh, was just funded in 1871. That was after the funding of the North German Confederation, which was a follow-up on the German Confederation. So that's uh, something very interesting to know because, you know, when the, when the wars were fought here in Europe with Napoleon, um, there were in, in Germany about 39 different states. That was actually Germany. There were different kingdoms and duchesses and countesses and all that stuff. So there were um, different rulers. And they were all ruled by one emperor that uh, eventually came from Rome in the, in the latter times. But um, it's very interesting to know that there was no German nation state before 1871. So just to make a um, little sum up about what Germany was or how it uh, came into being, I'm going to uh, read a little part of this that I prepared here for you. Um, the German history began long before the birth of the state Germany. The Roman commander Julius Caesar that's probably one we, ever, we all know, made public the term Germanic in his book on the Gallic War, about 50 years B.C. For him, it was a nation of wild barbarians. There actually was not speaking of a people. It was quite, uh, it were quite different tribes that fought brutally and spoke different dialects. And they do the same thing in Germany today, because in Hamburg you speak another German than you speak in Bavaria, for example. Now, in 500 AD, a great Frankish empire emerged that gradually converted to Christianity. Charlemagne, who uh, reigned uh, lived between 747 and 814, expanded the empire by wars and was 800 AD by the Pope in Rome proclaimed emperor. He looked at the direct, uh, he looked at the direct successor to the Roman Empire and believed that the power of the Romans had been transferred to his Frankish empire. And this was the beginning of the Western Empire. After the death of Charlemagne and his grandsons uh, fought about his heritage, the kingdom was divided. And from the western part, the West Frankish kingdom, France would later arise from the East Frankish Empire, arose Germany. So you get it, from the west, France arose, and from the east, Germany arose. But that would not become a nation state until 1871. Otto I, who reigned between 912 and 973, extended the East Frankish kingdom back from the Mediterranean to the North Sea. He sought it to the Emperor Charlemagne's idea of having an emperor, and in 962, the Pope of Rome crowned the emperor in Rome. Uh, from 1254, it was, it was called the Holy Roman Empire. In the 15th century, it added the word German nation. So we have this Holy Roman Empire in the first place, and then this specific part, where the barbarians, as Julius Caesar called them, 50 BC, uh, lived this Germanic uh, tribes, uh, were called the German nation. So this German nation was a part of the Holy Roman Empire. And the coloration of Otto I is associated, um, and the empire is considered with the beginning of German history, even when the kingdom was not a nation state, but consisted of many largely autonomous areas. So you have to know before, for example, the city that I come from is Hamburg. That was always a free city. Like also you have Bremen, that is also a free city even today. Free and Hansestadt. And Hansestadt, that means 
um, that was a confederation that some cities were in together internationally uh, in the 14, 15, 1600s, and they were a, a trade union, you can call it. And they were trading cities. They traded about the whole Baltic Sea and the North Sea. So there were uh, in, in the cities like Riga uh, in Lithuania, the stuff that you know, and in Sweden and in Denmark. And they all traded together. That was a hundred. That were free cities. So Hamburg was always a free city. Then you have the Kingdom of Hanover in the northern Germany. Then you have the Kingdom of Bavaria in the south of Germany. The Kingdom of Württemberg, the next. So all that together, you had 39 uh, different splinter states, let's call them. Can I interrupt here and, and hold your thought there? Yeah. Uh, when, you say, uh, when you say free state, could you explain that a little bit? What do you mean by a free state? Yeah, it was it, it was a state by its own. You know, it's um, it, it was never uh, uh, Hamburg, for example, is just a city, but it was never uh, included in, in some bigger state. Like like for example, you have uh, with Berlin uh, that is in the state of Brandenburg, and also Berlin is uh, always always extra. It's, it's it's an extra city of that. So I mean, the, the city always reigned for itself. Uh, That's uh, what I mean by free city. In other words, and it wasn't until um, the Second uh, Reich started to form that some of these uh, free states started to unite. Is that right? Yes, but the cities still uh, remain free. You know, they are. Okay, you can you can a little bit compare that. I mean, I think you can a little bit compare it like the way the United States of America is. The United States of America consists of fifty actually independent states. Uh, and they merged together in a union and agreed on having a federal government over them, right? Right, right. And uh, by that you can really compare that to Germany, but of course, because we have a longer history than the United States of America has, uh, we have had uh, kingdoms and countesses and all that stuff that, that came together. So it was not really a free state, let's say. All state had another ruler. And uh, these rulers often also uh, went to war with each other. There was a big war between uh, Prussia and the Habsburgs, meaning uh, the rulers from Austria. You know, Austria had this big kingdom, uh, Austria and Hungary. And um, there was a big war between those two. Uh, and after these two, um, there was the merger that, uh, that the so-called Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck uh, used when, when he created actually the, the first nation-state German Empire because there was this German Empire of, uh, of, of this uh, or this uh, uh, Roman Empire of German nation, but that was not uh, a nation-state because it was divided in all these kingdoms. And then you had this first really nation-state that was founded in 1871 after the war that Germany fought with France. And uh, then they found the, the first real German nation state. But still, still there were these uh, different uh, states in there, that, like Bavaria and all that stuff. So, well, let, let me ask you one other question. Uh, the question, the question I have is on the dialects. In other words, in other words, uh, even today in Germany, in other words, uh, is there one language uh, in Prussia? Uh, do people speak different dialects uh, even to this day? Well, uh, they speak the same language, but they speak different dialects. Yes, Saxons speak another dialect like the people in, in Cologne. In Cologne, they speak a different dialect from uh, people like in Frankfurt uh, in, in Hesse. Uh, they speak another dialect than in Bavaria. And uh, where I come from in Hamburg, uh, we speak what we call Hochdeutsch. That's the actual German that you really, um, that, that, that what, what you learn in school and, and pronounce just normal German. That's what we speak where we come from. In the, in, in well, 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 but we also, sorry, but we also have an older dialect that is called, um, that is called Plattdeutsch, means flat German. That's from, my, my grandmother spoke that, and I still understand a big part of it, but I can't speak it for, my, for myself. I haven't learned it to speak it anymore. Well, like when you go to Cologne or, or you go down to Bavaria, can can you understand these different dialects? 
In Bavaria, sometimes it's hard. <laughs> I mean, when you when you really go uh, into the country and you, and you end up on a little farm and you uh, talk to I don't know a farmer who is some 85 years old and has never spoken something else than his uh, dialect there, then you really get problems with that. But uh, now, for the moment, you know, I live since 23 years. I've been living in Belgium, and here in Belgium, it is even worse. Uh, Belgium is a very small country. It's about 200 kilometers from one side to the other. Uh, north, south, and east, west, yeah, and you crossed it, so it's not very big. But here, you really, sometimes 50 kilometers from here, you go and you talk to people in their own dialect, and you don't understand a word, and you just speak normal Dutch. And, well, it's, it's, it sounds like it may, maybe through the year of European history, as you, do you ever consider the fact that people cannot, can, that they're speaking all these different dialects, that sometimes they have a communication problem? I wouldn't say that they have a communication problem. I would say that it's their, their heritage, you know. We have more splinter states. Like It's not like not like Great Britain when you see we have this, this big country, Great Britain, and everybody speaks English, but still there. When you hear something really speaking Irish and someone really speaking his Scottish accent and someone else is just from London, and, and, and I don't, I don't know if they always get what they, what these guys say. I mean, when I hear these dialects, I also something uh, have problems to understand at all what they say. Well, I, I think you've answered some of my questions because that's true. Uh, somebody that is that uh, uh, is a strong in, in English, uh, they, uh, they, 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 you know, there's new like the Geneva Bible and. and the Geneva Bible and the King James are written in two different kinds of Englishes. Mm -hmm. that, that's the same kind of, it, 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 in other words, and, and so, you, so, uh, it, so you have to, uh, so in other words, another, you, know, it, you know, language by itself, or might kind of, they're getting a little derailed here, but you know, language by itself is very interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a study all by itself. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 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 you know, um, and, and, and so as time, as time has went on in Europe, like now, like yourself, you speak English, uh, but it, it, it's, 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 true to be, it's true to it's true, isn't it, that uh, a lot of uh, Europeans now speak English? Well, I can only speak for the people here in uh, Belgium, and here in Belgium, the children are um, taught English from I think uh, the fifth class, the fifth grade on. So quite early, I have seven or eight years of English here in school. Um, in Germany, that is uh, actually quite the same, but uh, in Germany, the people have a lot of problems speaking English. When you go in Germany on the streets and you interview people in English, uh, 70 or 80 percent will not uh, answer you because they are not able to speak that language. It's quite crazy when you think about it, but that's that's really the way it is. Yes, and I, I think a lot of times the average person we uh, we skip over that, and we, you know, uh, I mean, because because it it, it 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 definitely has, a, uh, you know, a way of communicating. In other words, it it, it sets up a, a a certain amount of a wall between if you can't communicate, you know, so so. Uh, uh, and, and that's something too that uh, as Americans uh, we don't the average American does not understand what we're I mean you know understand this because in other words there's so so many different languages that are spoke and concentrated like Hungary or Polish uh, you know all of these are you know, are are are, uh, are connected together see so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, American English is also not the same than English or British English. Yeah, but uh, you still understand each other. You have sometimes here and there you have another word. I mean, you say uh, in English you say lorry, and in America you say truck. But you both know what is meant. You know, you just here and there use another word for the same stuff. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes here and there there's a little bit difference in writing. Where in America you you leave the uh, the U when, for example, you speak about colors. Then you then then you write it in uh, in American English C O L O R S, and in uh, British you would uh, C O L O U R S, uh, write colors. Mm -hmm. So there's quite some differences, but that's not that big differences that you see. We don't understand each other, but when you hear the spoken word, 
and, and for example, you are really deep in Bavaria, for example, to come back to Germany, or you speak with someone with this, uh, that someone that has always lived in Cologne and in, 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 in that region, and to speak in the dialect from there, then as a normal German-speaking person, you sometimes really have trouble to understand them because they use other words and um, they are not that easily to drive from from what they said, you know. Especially here in Belgium, it's uh, very very interesting here in Belgium, absolutely. Well, the reason I brought this up is when you're mentioning the the the, 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 the many kingdoms, uh, there were many kingdoms as the formation, you know. And in other words, uh, the word, uh, in other words, Europe has, you might say, this is it's really changed even in the last hundred years as far as language. What, what has changed, uh, Europe or Germany? Uh, yeah, like the whole Europe. I mean, in other words, uh, uh, in other words, don't, don't you th don't you think that uh, uh, the the fact that you know the the, the more travel, like uh, the more people get to travel and, and, and interact, that people start speaking different languages. Well, I don't know if it has to do with uh, that people travel, but uh, you know, in Germany we uh, often say uh, it's, um, a term that is called Denglish. Um, because that is uh, put together from English and and and, and, and German, yeah. Uh, D for the German and English for so that means the uh, the actually um, Britishization or how you're going to call it of, of the German language, or the Americanization of the German language uh, by taking all over these these things. And, and sometimes the Germans are really funny, you know. They invent words that when you say in English, you don't understand. You know what Germans call their cell phone? No. They call it a handy. <laughs> uh, uh, a, ha a handy? A handy, yeah, because you can hold it in your hand. Okay, okay, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you yes. Yeah, yeah. You have, this, you have these, these strange words that, uh, yeah, when, when you come to America, and you say to an American, oh, sorry, I forgot my handy. <laughs> the guy was just like, "What's he saying?" Yes, yes, yes. And uh, and of course, um, the English language, uh, and that comes mostly because of um, because we are so close to the United States of America. What this rulership and uh, and the things that I mean, and and the trade connections that we have, um, the the American language is very much infiltrating the German language. So when when today, for example, you go to um, let's say um, a company is making a, a, a convention uh, to state about their year and, and business that they have, they put so many English terms in that that as a normal German you can't understand that anymore. So that's uh, very much in the economic world um, that's the case, you know. So this is this is kind of um, Germany is being abolished. You have you have the impression uh, when you watch that from a little bit of distance um, that people are trying to abolish the German language. And that brings me a little bit back to the subject that we were talking about, about this um, uh, derooting the Reformation. Huh? Right. Uh, when you, because when you, when you want to deroot something, then first you have to know where the root is. Huh? It's like when you have some crops in your garden that you want to get rid of and you don't take them out by the roots, they always come again, you know. Mm -hmm. So first you have to know where the root is. And uh, the root for the Reformation is in Germany and the punishment therefore is, for example, to make one point, uh, when you see the Georgia Guidestones, uh, which is a monument in the uh, American state of Georgia, in the U.S. state of Georgia, uh, that was uh, that is some t uh, big uh, monument of marmor of, of, of granite and marmor made, and there are ten commandments written in it. And these ten commandments are written in I think ten languages or twelve languages, uh, but not one of them is German. Uh -huh. It's yeah. written in English. It's in France. Uh, in French, it's in Chinese. It's in Swahili. It's in uh, Hebrew, I think, and. Uh, Ten languages, but not German. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that's the title of this series, is we're, we're, we're laying down some uh, history uh, starting from the Reformation, from 1517, 
and uh, kind of the, the average person, uh, including myself, was never taught this. And I, I'm at an age right now where uh, this you you have to to get this education that we're d- discussing here. You have to dig for it because uh, it's been kind of uh, uh, swept under the rug, wouldn't you say? Yes, absolutely. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, you know, the people today um, are not that God-believing anymore like people used to be, like, let's say, 150, 120 years ago. Um, the last generations that are walking the earth right now have never been farther, God, uh, farther away from God than any generation before them. They are all so distracted by this matrix the Jesuit put up very successfully on them, this matrix being uh, when you're young, two and a half years old, like in Belgium here, for example, then you go into daycare, and after that you go to school, and you come home, and you just watch television, and today, five, six-year-old kids, kids have their own tablet PCs or iPhones, whatever, where they are uh, always with this electronic stuff connected all together, and uh, all these things do anything for them. I mean, I just talked about it with my mother today uh, when we were in school, and uh, we wanted to have an uh, electric calculator that was forbidden uh, in, in, the, in the first years. And that was very good that it was forbidden, because then you really had to use your brain to do your counting. Today, uh, they can use these electronic calculators from the beginning on, I think. So people are actually uh, put in the, in the way to not use their brains anymore. And, and you mentioned that uh, in uh, in Belgium they they have they start the children at two and a half years old in kindergarten. Did I hear that yes. right? Yes, preschool two and a half years now. Yeah, see that uh, they have some stuff, but it's a little bit. They have schools over here, but it's a little bit later, five and six. But uh, yeah, that's that's that. Well, that's one of the reasons why um, we are are talking about the Reformation because to bring it back. Uh, because to understand what's going on today, you have to understand the Reformation. And the reason why people don't know the Reformation, again, is because we, I, I agree with you. There's The last three generations, they, there's just been so much distract, distraction, and they have uh, um, taken the credibility using all the universities over the whole world uh, teaching uh, Jesuit casuistry and sophistry, uh, learning upon learning, they have taken uh, uh, that that part of history out, and and people don't even have it, so you can't even find it. You can't even get a conversation. But once you once you understand, and I, once you understand this, things open up. History opens up. And uh, so that's why we're going back to the Reformation, because at the start of the Reformation, if prior to the Reformation, I mean, it was it was the what you call the First Reich. Is that right? Yeah, it was the Holy Roman Empire oh, okay. under yeah. un, uh, under German nation. So yeah. that's the, in this Holy Roman Empire that was bigger than Germany alone, or this uh, or this borders that you know from Germany alone. That was bigger than that, but in that embedded was a part that was called a German nation, yeah. And this was splintered up into different kingdoms and duchesses and all that stuff. Yes, and all these different kingdoms got their prior to 1517, all got their right to rule, and they got it from Rome. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. they were, they were, they were, you know, two or three kings together, kingdoms together were then ruled by one emperor above them, and the emperor mostly came from Rome. So it's like Charlemagne and then all these uh, emperors that, that we've had in that time. Yeah? So above a king, there's an emperor. You see, see, and it's so, it's so uh, people that are coming through here and, and would happen to be listening to this discussion uh, and, and not being biblical, they would under, not understand uh, what the Reformation, the reason why we have such a liberal movement and uh, f- how philosophy has uh, and reasoning and the new age is because we, because, because the, the Bible has been discredited and it's not, it's not 
it's not like it was in 1517 when when the Bible and the and the printing press was invented, and all of a sudden people, the common people, got the Bible in their hands. Uh, the secular world always has, has to understand that this is why this is so important, because they wouldn't have the liberal mind they have today. <laughs> Uh, they would still be uh, uh, serps in, in, in the feudal system if it wasn't for the for the uh, the explosion of the Protestant Reformation. You, you have a comment on that? Yeah, I have a comment on that because um, I, I stated last week or in another broadcast that we had that I said well there were two major inventions in humanity uh, in the time of, of humankind actually, and that was uh, the well invention of the book press. And that was the invention of the internet. That is uh, almost the same. And uh, with the invention of the uh, of the book press, people now had the possibility to read books, which never was there before. You know, when, when they sat together, uh, most families uh, in the living room or in the kitchen or wherever they sat together, they were talking about and um, their uh, their memories and their things that they've gone through that were told from from person to person but never written down. And uh, what was written down, well, you could go to libraries, but the normal peasant, uh, the, the, how are you going to say that, um, the normal uh, citizen uh, didn't have the possibility even to go to a library and, and read books, or even was not in the possibility of reading, because books were not available. But when the book press uh, came out by Gutenberg, um, the possibility was uh, once there, to really spread these things, not not only via via books, but also via pamphlets. Uh, uh, that's the, what what, uh, what later was done. That you just take uh, one page and then you distribute the same information by 1,000 uh, printed over 1,000 pages, and you distribute it to 1,000 people. So they really have the possibility to read that. I mean, that was not the case with Luther when he uh, nailed his 95 theses on the church door. That was one paper that he nailed there. But later you could copy that a thousand times and give it to a thousand people to read it. And so the people got interested in that and then they also, uh, they also started to read. And there was always somebody who, who was going to teach that because 400, 500 years ago we didn't have a school system like we have today, you know. People just grew up and they, they, uh, they learned their professions from, from their fathers and, uh, and their mothers and um, it was a different kind of living that uh, that we have today, completely different of what we have today. So okay. the uh, so the invention of the book press is, is something very uh, um, very important because then a lot of people just had access to information, like with the internet that came up some uh, 20 years ago. Now uh, it's the same thing. People have uh, had uh, all this, all of a sudden the possibility to get information. But with the Internet, um, that is something different than with the book press because in the Internet there is so much deception uh, and so much distraction, let's call it, like pornography and all that stuff that is on the Internet that takes the real people away from really studying and, and, and taking the chance of really um, getting to know things that they maybe always wanted to know. But they are so distracted by these things that they say, okay, uh, Lady Gaga left a fart at that restaurant that is much more interesting to me than uh, the history of uh, where, where my family comes from, for example, which you can look up on the Internet. You know what I mean? Y yes, and, and, and uh, uh, the, the fact that the, we, the tool that we have here, with, we have so much information that we could accessible but what what they have done before they give us this tool, they before the internet was given to the public, they they give them all the distractions first, mm -hmm. and so so in other words, uh, the, the the ability to critically think for themselves uh, has been um, uh, has been taken away from the general public, and um, uh, and then we because we have so many things. There's so much disinformation out there that we could spend hours just trying to refute the disinformation. And uh, uh, I, uh, 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 so it, it, it amazes me too. Here, here, Yerk and I are visiting Yerk 
uh, he's in Europe and I'm in the United States, and we're we we're, we have the same uh, uh, capabilities as far as researching and getting information, and it's and it's not we are are a minority. And the goal of this broadcast and the sharing with people is to um, is to instill a little bit of interest to do to get into some research because the things that we were researching you'll be once you see 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 this you'll all of a sudden you'll start seeing the distractions and the reason why we are not talking with our neighbors the reason why we're not sitting down and having dinner together uh uh it's 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 because of all the activities they put upon us and uh so uh uh, so that that is one of the reasons uh, that that uh, what we're the goal of this bro- whole broadcast is is uh, so anybody listening that would like to contact us and maybe add have something to add uh, feel free to go to Grand Design Exposed and uh, um, and there's an email address at the bottom where you can uh, you can email us and we'd uh, love to hear from you or you know I'm and I'm appealing to anybody that hears this in Europe or or any place in in the world right now I mean uh, the, the only what we're trying to what we're trying the main goal is to spark a little interest uh uh cuz the same spark that Martin Luther sparked in 1517 all of a sudden it was like taking the lid off of uh uh, of, of learning, all of a sudden, the, the common person could 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 uh, could could learn. I mean, he could read for himself because uh, 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 the, <clears throat> the the Reformation opened the uh, the floodgates for the middle class. Before be, before the Reformation, there was no middle class, and because there there was only two. Two kinds of people in society. There was, there was, uh, there there was the the slave owners and the slaves. It was just there. Was, there was not three groups of people. And so uh, yeah, but actually, Walt today is just the same. But but the people don't see it, you know, because they are living in the prison where they don't see the bars. Yeah, well, you're you're absolutely you're absolutely right, but not, but but. But what you said just a little bit earlier, uh, the last three generations, I mean, the last 30 years is when the acceleration, and, and in other words, and it's not, they're, they not only hit, hit the United States, but they've hit Europe and they've hit Australia, I, uh, you know, South Africa. I mean, it doesn't matter where you go. They are eliminating the middle class. And uh, because at one time in this country, this is the reason people flooded to America. But Yerk is absolutely right. There, there is there. The middle class is 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 almost been wiped out. And it's uh, uh, there's still a middle class in America, but uh, they 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 don't understand that their bars are going to be broken down uh, uh, in the future. Yeah, there's still a middle class in Germany, and here where I live in Belgium too. But it's getting smaller and smaller. You have more people rising up to the higher classes, and even more people going down to the lower class. So, when you will actually have a two class system again, like we always had when we were ruled by kingdoms, by grand duchies and duchies and principalities. You know, there were the rulers and there were the peasants or the normal workers. And that's and that's a good comment, and that's the reason why for the broadcast. That's why going back to the Reformation and talking about these kingdoms and what happened at the Reformation. So anyway, uh, uh, we maybe got a little derailed, but I I think uh, I think uh, uh, people understand uh, how important it is to lay the foundation of the Reformation and what it caused. See what it caused. Well, who was who? Who were they breaking away from? See, what what was the break? Uh, you you want to ask uh, comment on that, uh, Yerk? Yeah, the people break away from God, and um, the the Reformation was about bringing God to the people. I mean, we always talk about the Reformation and how it started in Germany, but we we forget about things like uh, the Valdenses. 
um, there were people who lived for almost 1,200 years in the, in the mountains of Switzerland, and um, they were spreading the word of God from there. Um, there's a very interesting uh, documentary I saw on YouTube about this. They send out, uh, it's called the Israel of the Alps, if you want to look that up. Israel of the Alps, uh, three-part documentary, very interesting, where you can see that the Valdensis always send out two people uh, in the beginning of the year, and they hopefully sometimes they come back, sometimes they were killed or went too far away to come back, and, and, and they were uh, giving the, the, the word of God into the world. And they also, from Switzerland there, came to, came to Germany. Uh, the word of God by, by real God-believing Christians was always upheld by people like the Valdensis. And then the Germans, um, the Germans came in by, uh, by the person of Luther, who uh, was actually a Catholic uh, priest, but uh, got into his conscience and saw that a lot of things were not right and that uh, what, what was taught by the Catholic Church was not the word of God as it was written in the Bible. And so that uh, figured, the, uh, figured the Reformation, and that made people think. And uh, because now they had this feeling, okay, we were abused by our masters, so-called masters, or masters, actually. We were abused by them. Now we're going to revolt. We want to have our own human rights. We are talking about today, Obama and all these politicians always speaking about human rights, human rights. There was no speak of that 400, 500 years ago. People had no rights, and that came with that with that revolution. So the Reformation really set up a conscience in the people that they were more than just the peasants that they were, and that there was more to life than just this earthly life that we are uh, living right now, which is in this materialistic world that we are forced to live in. Mm -hmm. That there's actually more to that. So they had the possibility to really study, study the Bible and see what life is really all about, and that there was uh, that we are all born in sin, but there was someone uh, who was uh, the son of uh, the son of God, born into this world, and took away all the sins by um, by being uh, put on the cross in Calvary and taking all the sins uh, sins away from us. This is something that the people today have uh, well. A very little understanding of and that, that should go back into them because the Reformation brought actually freedom to the people freedom of the mind you know? freedom of conscience freedom of conscience yeah because when, 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 you, when you don't know that you are a slave well then uh, then you're always, always quiet I mean you don't do anything because you think that's just the way it has to be you know I, I gave you I, I gave you one time this example where when you sit on the on the back of a donkey and you hold a carrot in front of his nose, he will walk and walk and walk for miles and for days and for weeks until he gets finally uh, will get that carrot which he will never get because he put it always a few centimeters before his nose but he can't get it you know, and that's what uh, the elite so-called elite does with the normal people, um, just putting out there something. Uh, is it education? Is it a career? Is it money? Is it a nice car? Is it a pretty woman that you can get? Whatever. They put yeah. these things uh, uh, out in front of you there, and the people are running after them. Forget that there's more to life than just that. In the enslavers, in the enslavers, we want to make has always been Rome. Rome is the one that that was <clears throat> that uh, that ruled during the Dark Ages. It's always Rome true because Rome hides behind religion, the facade of religion. It's like today, I mean, there was a time in history where this exploded and people seen who the boogeyman was. And all the reformers, Luther, Calvin, Knox, they all knew who the Antichrist was. The one that was enslaving them. And you can go today to any country that's living in poverty. And it's a Roman Catholic country. That's the reason why Mexico, that's why Mexico has been enslaved. They, the people do not understand that it's their 
it's their church, the Roman Catholic Church, that's keeping them enslaved. That's the reason why South America is, 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 and, and why America has, we call them third world countries. Well, Rome is doing the same thing today. The same thing is happening today. But the reason I want to bring this, bring this up is, you see, is what, what ruled the Holy Roman Empire and the First Reich was the Vatican. It was the Vatican that caused it. And when, when that Protestant Reformation exploded, uh, I want to go this route here, uh, uh, Yerk. In other words, when it exploded, it's something, it went to Sweden, it went to Pol- Poland. Uh, could, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how, what the, the effects of uh, Protestantism had on, on, uh, on Poland? Well, uh, Poland was um, actually a country that was uh, completely Protestant because the kings of uh, Poland were Protestant. But I also read that a lot of the normal people, like the peasants and the normal workers, held on to the Catholic beliefs. Um, Today, uh, Poland is known as a Catholic country, but the Reformation made great progress in that country, uh, of course. And, uh, you know, students from Wittenberg, which is not so far away from the Polish border, brought the Reformation message uh, early to Danzig and Krakow. Danzig is even, uh, was even East Germany later on, but Krakow is uh, pure in, in Poland. And um, elsewhere, these national sentiments directly affected the course of the reform movement, and partly because of the Polish political traditions, partly because of long-standing ties with France, and partly because of a growing antipathy towards Germans, the Poles, uh, took much more strongly to Calvinism and Calvinistic sects than uh, Lutherism. It's worth pointing out, too, that the Hussites had flourished in Western Poland, so the country had a long uh, tradition of dissatisfaction with the clergy. Moreover, the country also had a long tradition of religious toleration. Many Jews had fled thither to persecutions in the West, and there was even an Islamic Tatar population in Lithuania. In the event, a number of different reformed churches uh, took root in Poland, especially during 1540s and 1550s. So that's when you see that Luther wrote his Bible in 1522, that's 20, 30 years after that. And uh, the ideas and enclaves could be found everywhere. Different flavors of Protestantism flourished in different regions of Poland for exactly the same reason they did in Germany, due to the preferences and protections of the local nobility. You see, it's always the nobility, the kings and duchess and, uh, and counts and whatever uh, you have as rulers. What they prefer, they put on the people they live under. And in Poland, at that moment, the kings that ruled were kind of free to choose their confession. And there were a lot of kings who chose the Protestant confession. But actually, uh, Poland is seen as the, the biggest success uh, in the Culture Reformation. Uh, when you measure it on the Jesuits. You know, the nobility in the 16th century was Protestant. Polish kings were Catholic, and King Sigismund III, the third, I say, so there was one and two before him, but the third, who was uh, on reign between 1586 and 1632, he was Jesuit trained. So the king was Jesuit trained. What does that mean? That does mean that he gives the Jesuit viewpoint and the Catholic viewpoint to his people because people are always uh, taught and indoctrinated by their rulers, in this case, King Sigismund, and he was Jesuit trained. So that led to um, that in 1717, that's uh, a century after that, um, in, uh, in Poland it was forbidden to build any new evangelical church and every church that has been built, evangelical church that has been built uh, since 1632, was ordered to be torn down. And if you uh, denied the Catholic uh, belief, you were given the death sentence. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. yeah yes. And, and understand the listeners, when we, when we talk about this, how did they do this? How did they tear these churches down? They did it legally because they... That's the when we when we talk about the Jesuits, the Jesuits infiltrate the nobility. They're the ones. They are the confessors. They, that's the reason why they know exactly what's going on because they're the confessors to these nobilities. 
And that's how they infiltrate. That's why nobody understands today who the, even the Jesuits are. Well, the Jesuits are everybody. They are, so as somebody said uh, lately to you, they are really under every stone. Y- 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 yes, they in other take, words. They take every form and shape that they need to do, uh, whether it's scholars in the schools or universities, whether it's uh, in the clergy, in the, in, the, uh, in the belief system, whether it's uh, in, in politics. I mean, you can, you can choose whatever profession you want. Um, a Jesuit can be uh, hide behind it. And, and, and also, the, the Jesuits, the Jesuits are not Christian and they're not Catholic. They're anti-Catholicism. I mean, the people in the in the in this country today, and they're called the Society of Jesus. That's cloaked in a. It, it's it's really another word for it is fraud. And the, and the American, we're we're in a in a gr- in grave danger, in the world today, because the lack of the ignorance, of how this op- how they operate, and a good example of that is the United States right now. Joseph Biden is a Jesuit, the vice president. Obama is completely surrounded by Jesuits. His mentor. I can't pronounce the fellow's name out of Chicago, but he his, he's the one that got Obama started on the election campaign. I mean, I have a picture at Grand Design Exposed of the of his of six he had, of his intelligence group around Obama, and five out of the six are Jesuit trained. There's six out of nine chief justices. So how did they take Poland down? They infiltrated it. They infiltrated the nobility. And one thing I want to I want to bring out here is the nobility during the Holy Roman Empire. The, see, the nobility is Roman Catholicism has always been the rich man's religion. Birds of a feather flock together. And see, the Protestant Reformation infiltrated that. And you had rulers that split. I mean, it caused a revolution, and even to this day, and even the people that go to, or that are graduate from these universities, and they become staunch liberals, they do not understand where that liberalism came from. They're being trained to think that way, and they, they and they've got that education through the Jesuitical universities over the whole world. And but going back to Poland now, all I wanted to intercede here is the fact that uh, that's how they took it down. They passed the laws, and then they started tearing the churches down. See, it's easy to abide the law when you make the law, huh? <laughs> Yes, yes, you know, that's a very good point, very good point. That's, you know. that's something that people do not see today, even in, uh, in America, with all the changes in, in the laws. I mean, things that were allowed even five years ago are today uh, not only frowned upon, but, but even uh, prosecuted. I mean, think of uh, little children uh, selling lemonade in their front garden and some uh, some police coming up there and destroying all that and saying you're not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. Yes. There are laws. There are laws written that people have no idea of and uh, and they don't see that until they are confronted it by themselves. And yeah, it's it's no problem to obey the law when you when you write the law. So I can write the law that uh, from tomorrow it's all right to kill anybody because Obama does just that with his drone strikes that he does. He thinks I am I am the king here, and I can do whatever I want, and I and I say this one has to die, and that one has to die. I make the law. I write the executive order. Nobody's gonna stop me. Yes, uh, just like it was in the in the old Rome. But coming coming back to the to the Reformation, because I think we are uh, a little bit um, out of uh, out of subject here for the moment. Um, I just want to go back to okay the title, derooting the Reformation. You have to see that. Um, the Jesuits, when they were formed, 
their main goal was to bring every nation, every kingdom, every republic, whatever, every nation back completely under the role of uh, under the rule of the Pope. That is their first and main goal. Okay? Then by doing that, later the Jesuits infiltrated the Vatican and their uh, their goal then was, of course, and still is, well, not only to bring all countries under the rule of the Pope, but also we are going to determine who is going to be the Pope. And the Pope is going to be one of us. And by that, they can then later abolish the whole Vatican and remain in power. That's the actual idea. So, but when you want to have all the countries back under the rule of the Pope, then you certainly have to start with that countries that first went away from there. So we have this thousand-year German Reich, of, or this uh, Holy Roman Empire of German nation for a thousand years, and then for some uh, hundred, hundred years something else, uh, and from 1871 to, to 1918, the Second Reich, uh, that broke away from this from this Roman control. That was the problem. And therefore, Germany has always been the target of the Jesuits uh, with the First World War and then later with the Second World War. And how can you better uh, take care of, let's say, kill all the Protestants when you when you push the, uh, the one Protestant country against the other one Protestant country and let them kill each other, like they did when they, <clears throat> when they forced the English soldiers, who were mostly Protestant, against the German soldiers, who were mostly Protestant, to kill each other for the gain of the Pope. You have some marks on the remarks on that there, Walt? No, yeah, yes, that's... Uh... That's been done all the way through history. I mean, they did that in, the, in America with the Civil War. The Civil War, the, the South was predominantly Protestant, and the, the North was, um, uh, there was Catholics in the North, but there was still uh, lots of Protestants. So when they started the Civil War, they had Protestants killing Protestants. Yes, patriotism. Patriotism in the North against patriotism in the South. Yes, and they and so, patriotism they, they they use still today. It, it's so easy. Man, go for your country, you know. You, you, you know, we 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 have another seven minutes here. I'd like to have you just uh, uh, recap a little bit, starting on the second right, and uh, from uh, and when uh, it was around. Uh, uh, I want I want what I want to have bring out is the fact that the Jesuits were thrown out of Germany. Uh, am I right to say that they, uh, the, at the start of the Third Reich, the, the Jesuits were thrown were thrown out of Germany? Um, at the start of the Second Reich, yeah. Yes. From, that, that ruled from 1871 to 1918, so the end of World War One. Uh, in 1872, uh, our Chancellor uh, Otto von Bismarck let pass a law that ab- abolished the Jesuit order in Germany. And um, that law was softened by 1904, and it was abolished in 1917. Um, You also have to know he did that in 1872, and in 1880, uh, the emperor released Bismarck of his duties. So the emperor was not always in in agreement with what, uh, uh, what Bismarck did. But Bismarck did a lot for the social security in Germany there. He was the founder of the, uh, of the pension care so that people had, uh, could go uh, into retirement. Uh, that was not possible before. So this whole social system um, that, was, that is today normal in all the countries, let's say, um, that we have to thank on, on, uh, on Bismarck. And we had a very flourishing uh, economy at that time also. Germany started building a, a whole fleet and uh, was building colonies and became, because of that, a threat to, to the English. But in 1872, he made a law that uh, the Jesuits were thrown out of Germany. And the 
Jesuits never forget, and they never forget. So that also is one of the reasons why Germany was torn into World War I. And um, by that, um, they, they lost that World War. And, um, well, this uh, treaty was made then in Versailles, in the, in the Hall of Mirrors, in that uh, beautiful castle of Versailles, at the, uh, in the suburbs of, of Paris. And um, the Germans were there uh, all in a sudden presented um, with why they have lost the war. But that is something that we could take uh, take on on another broadcast. Uh, I'm talking about the Balfour Declaration here. That's very interesting uh, to mention. But, you know, Germany was uh, not only found guilty for the whole world war, but also uh, put on a load of money they had to pay until in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, Germany still paid reparations for the First World War. Um, even though that if you study real history, you see that Germany is not guilty of, uh, on the outbreak of the war, but that's another point right now. But um, the Jesuits used that to, uh, to really destroy Germany. And the farther we go into the history, then we see what happened between the Second Reich, 1918, and the Third Reich, 1933, when Hitler came to power, and even when Hitler came to power, Hitler had only, uh, I think, really just one big uh, target to, to go for, and that is destroy, destroy Germany and destroy the German people. And by getting them into the world war the way that he did, and by losing that world war, that's exactly what happened. Because afterward, Germany was occupied by the Allies, by America, France, and, uh, and England, uh, put into different sections, and then Russia, of course, on the other hand, on, uh, on the East Front, put into different sections, and really split up and um, by, for example, uh, having East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, uh, that was ruled more or less from Russia, were atheists. Well, uh, the eastern of Germany was the most Protestant part of Germany in that time. So that's why also it's something that we're going to go in another broadcast. I think uh, you have the bombing of Dresden, where hundreds of thousands, I think 500,000 people died in the bombings there. And that was just a war against civilians because there were no military targets there. It mm -hmm. was just a war against civilians, against the people who fled from, from, from Eastern Prussia and all that stuff, and then Slo and uh, Pommern, where they all came from, uh, looking for shelter in, in, in Dresden, and they were bombed into oblivion. Yes, and uh, what... Um Jörg is bringing up, bringing up here, you see that relates to the first 30-year war in the 1600s. There was 12 million Germans killed. And, uh, uh, and you see the reason for the, the target for the destruction of Germany uh, is because to destroy that culture, that, uh, that, that spirit, that that it will never that because that's where the Protestant Reformation exploded like a and they couldn't control it because to even today now with the European Union um, uh, I think uh, I think I've heard you say this I mean you know I think I, I think it, it's finally the gold and and we know who's behind the European Union. Who's behind the European Union is, is the same enemy we've been fighting. It's the Antichrist. It's Rome. See, and the Reformation, the Reformation was targeting, they were trying to get out from under the thumb of the Antichrist. They all pinned the tail on the donkey, and that was in Rome. And so, uh, uh, anyway, with that, we're, we're, we've run out of time, Yerk. Uh, uh, Yerk, would you like to tell them uh, where they can, get a, they can uh, uh, connect with your uh, YouTube? Um, yes, um, when you want to go to YouTube, my channel is called Juggler66. And when you take a look at the last video that I made, I, will, uh, I have provided some links also about the things that we are talking about today. Uh, about this uh, German Confederation or North German uh, North German Confederation, 
and that you can really look this history up for yourself. I mean, this is just easy links like Wikipedia and all that stuff, but the name of my channel on YouTube is Joggler66, J-O-G-G-L-E-R-6-6. Just Google it, and you will also come to there. So 